a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have Sabbath, the 7th of October 2017, and uh, as you see on the date, this is just one day after recording this part one uh, of my introduction to you of this little booklet, uh, this little magazine, Truth and History, that I got from Brett Norman some time ago. And uh, I asked you at the end of uh, the first video to let me know if you really want to have a, con uh, a conclusion, a continuation of this reading and um, uh, of Martin Luther in the month of October. And uh, of course, I haven't even published that one yet, so I don't know what your responses are. I just want to tell you whatever your responses are. Uh, don't get me wrong, of course there will be a continuation and I will probably also read the complete book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil by Martin Luther, which, which he wrote in 1545. The only question that I wanted to, to know actually is if I could upload, if I should upload these also during the month of October, Reformation month, because this is a very important month. Even the Roman Catholic Church says that she celebrates 500 years of Reformation. Yeah, if you believe that, I can sell you a bridge on the moon too. Um, and if you want to know the truth about that, well, go to First Amendment Radio and uh, listen to the last few playlists of um, Tom Fress there on Inquisition Update. Luther, uh, Martin Luther, in his own words, is one of them, and uh, uh, for the moment he is reading this newsletter of Richard Bennett, and I don't know, maybe he starts afterwards with reading this book of my Martin Luther also, um, and he can tell you, <laughs> like I can tell you, that whenever the Roman Catholic Church says, says that they celebrate 500 years of Reformation, they don't. They hate the Reformation. They hate Protestants. And that's throughout their history, no question, no discussion about that. Uh, but my point with uploading this during the month of October is that <clears throat> today on the 7th, I uploaded part 4 of the book reading. And up to now, I have 13 readings done. And when I do one every second day, then I arrive at number 13, which I have done already on the 26th. So I know that I have one, but probably even two readings left in German. And that would mean that on the 31st I could uh, finish. And that was actually my idea. And that is without any English videos in between. So... <laughs> yeah, you know, month of October for bilingual video uploads should have 60 days, not 30 or 31. <laughs> so this is why I don't even know if I can manage to um, get the uploads done. Anyway, um, let's start. Uh, yesterday I concluded, uh, or I started reading this little uh, booklet that uh, uh, Brett Norman sent me and we were speaking about... Uh, in the very first place, we were speaking about the, what, what is, uh, where is this picture here? Um, <clears throat> what do we owe to the Reformation? And I told you that uh, there actually is no Reformation because the Church of Satan, the Synagogue of Satan, the Roman Catholic Church cannot be reformed. It is irreformable. But there was a great awakening to protest that one. And uh, that came, of course, because uh, first in England through Wycliffe and later in uh, Germany and almost all of Europe because of Martin Luther, the people got, uh, got a hand on the Bible, the Word of God. And the Dark Ages all of a sudden uh, were lightened with the light of God. Uh, and let's... Uh, what we read yesterday, what do we owe to the Reformation, these six points from uh, Anglican Bishop John C. Ryle, 
who we already know, of course, from All Roads Lead to Rome, as you probably remember from these readings. I know, also a book series that I've done last year that is not completely uploaded yet, but that will be finished uh, this year, 2017, I can promise you that. Then from there we went on and uh, spoke about John Wycliffe and then John Huss and now William Tyndale before we come to Luther and conclude this little booklet. <coughs> because I think to me it is important um, that uh, when we read about the Reformation that we start with the oldest, in this case Wycliffe, and start with the youngest, in this case Martin Luther. And um, so that's why I'm going to continue now the reading. And uh, we are going to read now about William Tyndale. Again, like yesterday, you have the two pages here. It's just the page in white. The page in blue is uh, not for us to read. Um, you can read it anyway if you want to, but I'm not going to read that out loud. So I'm going to start now to read what is written here about uh, William Tyndale. During the Protestant Reformation, the Lord raised up a man whose work would reshape the foundation of Western civilization. William Tyndale was born in 1494 in Gloucestershire, England. That means Luther is born in 1483, so Luther was 11 years older than William Tyndale. <clears throat> but as you will see at the end of this reading, William Tyndale died before Martin Luther. William Tyndale entered Oxford University at nine years old, so that's in 1503, and received his master's degree at 21. Proficient in Greek, he was able to study Erasmus' Greek New Testament. He could read and speak, listen, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, French, Italian, Spanish, German, and, of course, his native English. Tyndale had an amiable personality and was known for a virtuous life. Tyndale published religious views which were heretical to the Roman Catholic Church and later by the Church of England. Well, the Church of England actually was never a pure, 100% Bible-based church. And when we want to discuss about that, we can go into the 39 articles of the Confession of Faith of Westminster and all that stuff. And you will see that those are not adhering to the Bible at all, as you may first think. But the Anglican Church was a breakaway from the Roman Catholic Church. And 11, a little leaven of the Roman Catholic Church still was in there and never got out. That's why even the Church of England also viewed Tyndale heretical. But we are speaking about the Church of England at the time <coughs> before it was completely reformed, and that the Roman Catholic Church viewed Tyndale's views and writings, of course, as heretical is normal. Even though we know that the correct interpretation of what is heretical means everything that is not adhering to the Bible. But of course the Roman Catholic Church has another interpretation of that. No wonder. Anyway, while a tutor in the family of Sir John Walsh, about 1520 he encountered opposition from Catholic dignitaries. His espousal of the tenets of Martin Luther and the Reformation ostracized him from church leaders. When conversing with Tyndale, a priest infuriated him by saying, We are better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. That's what Roman Catholic priests actually think, teach and preach all their life. We are better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. Meaning, the laws of man, the laws of the Pope, the laws of the Antichrist are above the laws of the Creator God. That's all that means. But Tinder fervently retorted, quote, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you, unquote. 
One of the most important and well-known quotes of William Tyndale. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plough to know more of the scriptures than you. Which is actually not that different, because the Roman Catholic priests do not know anything of scripture, because they don't even have the scripture. The normal Roman Catholic priest was forbidden to study the Bible. That book was off limits, because even a Roman Catholic priest, uh, priest, if he came to the New Testament, and he came into Second Thessalonians 2, and he came into Revelation 13, 17 and 18, knew that his boss was the Antichrist. So, the normal priest was forbidden to read the Bible as the normal man, the layman in the street, was forbidden to read the Bible. And when priests got a hold of the Bible, well, something like William Tyndale came out of them, something like um, John Wycliffe came out of them, and Martin Luther. Martin Luther also had his experience in the beginning of the 1500s when he first was given the Bible. And you can read on that account in the wonderful book Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness. There it is um, there it is written down, and that's taken from the book from uh, the history of Protestantism from uh, Daubigny. Anyway, this uh, fervently retorted answer from Tyndale is, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plough to know more of the scriptures than you, Roman Catholic priest. In translating the New Testament, discovered it risky to do so in England. He went to Cologne in Germany in 1524, but soldiers of the Holy Roman Empire raided the print shop. He fled with as many pages as he could to Worms, you know, the city where Martin Luther was uh, summoned to in uh, 1521 to repent of his working, where his translations were printed in, in 1525 through 1526 with copies smuggled into England in bales of cotton. He was the first Bible translator to have his work printed on the Gutenberg Press. Because John Wycliffe also translated the Bible, but at that time when John Wycliffe was working, the Gutenberg Press was not yet invented. That was an invention of the mid-1400s, and that was before the time of John Wycliffe. So, it is actually William Tyndale whose translating of the Bible was first printed on the Gutenberg Press. Not Martin Luther's, it was William Tyndale's. As it says here, because it's in English. Yeah? He was the first Bible translator to have his work printed on the Gutenberg Press in English. I'm not sure that Martin Luther, who translated the Bible a few years before into German, 1521-1522, did not also make use of the Gutenberg Press. So... But anyway, there is no contention here about that. Now, England's Archbishop of Canterbury launched a campaign to buy copies of the Bible to destroy them by fire. Besides his Bible translations, Tyndale wrote The Obedience of a Christian, which I may uh, intervene here a little bit. The Obedience of a Christian is a work from Martin Luther. Huh? which was read by Anne Boleyn and favorably impressed her husband, King Henry VIII. Yeah, that English king that you only know as a fornicator, the one who actually then, because he had a dispute with the Pope about divorce, okay, but he threw out the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Yeah? He actually was the one and we're going to read that in a moment also, who put the Bible in the English, English churches, the English Bible, the Bible from Tyndale. Yeah? So, William Tyndale wrote The Obedience of a Christian, which was read by Anne Boleyn, and favorably impressed her husband, King Henry VIII. Tyndale's book, The Practice of Prelates, angered the king, so the one impressed him, the other one angered him, because of Tyndale's stand against divorce. 
Tyndale had a biblical stance against divorce and the king, of course, had a human stance for divorce. <laughs> and that explains, that explains um, why the king, Henry VIII, was angered. The king of England with paper Rome and the Holy Roman Empire became Tyndale's enemies. And I add, at first. By 1535... Tyndale engaged in public evangelistic work until he was betrayed by Henry Phillips, posing as a friend who arranged for Tyndale's arrest in Antwerp, Belgium. Now, let me ask you one thing. Where have we read that before? That a friend arranged an arrest of another so-called friend. Doesn't that remind you of Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ? When 1535 Tyndale engaged in public evangelistic work until he was betrayed by Henry Phillips, who posed as a friend and who arranged for Tyndale's arrest in Antwerp, Belgium? Yeah, Doesn't that remind you of the story of Judas Iscariot and our Lord Jesus Christ? Tyndale suffered seclusion in a dungeon prison in the castle of Vivore, which is in Brussels, for over 16 months, was tried and convicted for religious heresy as an enemy of the English monarch and the Church of England. Before his execution, Tyndale declared, quote, I call God to record that I have never altered against the voice of my conscience, one syllable of his word, nor would do, to this day, if all the pleasures, honors and riches of this earth might be given me." Unquote. This is a very profound statement that Tyndale declared before his execution. Why? Because this is the same, of course, in different words, that Jesus Christ said against the temptations of the devil, which we can read in Matthew. When Jesus Christ was uh, tempted, and he was out there for 40 days and was tempted by the devil, and the devil uh, told him, to, uh, uh, all these kingdoms I give to you if you bow down and worship me. Jesus Christ, of course, answered, it is written, uh, get, uh, get, uh, get hence, uh, Satan, it is written, thou shalt obey, uh, thou shalt worship the Lord God uh, alone. Uh, I don't have the exact wording right now, but you get the jest. But actually, William Tyndale, just before his execution, says, with other words, exact the same thing. I call God to record that I have never altered against the voice of my conscience, and the voice of his conscience is the word of God. One syllable of his word, nor, sh nor would do to this day, if all the pleasures, honors and riches of this earth might be given me. He was tied to the stake, strangled, and his body burned on October 6th, 1536. So that was yesterday. Within three years, in 1539, a copy of the English Bible was required to be in every parish church in England. Tyndale's last prayer in his dying hour was, quote, Lord, open thou the King of England's eyes. And I have a nice picture of that, I think, here, that I can show you. Um, nice picture. Yeah, what's nice about someone at the stake, but the point is that you can see here William Tyndale was uh, strangled before he got burned, so they didn't burn him alive. That was kind of a mercy <coughs> they gave him. And while that happens, as you can see, you can read here, it says, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Those are the last prayers, the last recorded words of William Tyndale when before he was burned at the stake in Vilvorde, which is here at Brussels, some 25 kilometers from where I live. 
Now, during the 45-year reign of Protestant uh, of um, uh, Protestant Queen Eng uh, Elizabeth between 1558 and 1603, in England's golden age, the English language flourished, resulting in the 1611 King James 1611 King James Bible, which retained over 80% of Tyndale's wording, because Tyndale made use of the original Textus Receptus and of the um, Textus Receptus Greek translation of Erasmus. So therefore the Bible from William Tyndale is quite correct historically. And uh, here we have a picture of Tyndale's Bible. I just want to show you this one. And this Bible was for about 80% the basis for the 1611 King James Bible. So Queen Elizabeth reigned between 1558 and 1603 and this is called here England's Golden Age. Why? Because it was a Protestant reign. Queen Elizabeth was no saint. She also persecuted people for their beliefs. And I recorded that in my reading on my second channel, you probably remember, um, that I told you here on my second channel, Joggler's War on Disinformation, uh, you have this playlist about the history of the Inquisition that you see here. And um, there I also recorded the shortcomings or failings of Queen Elizabeth. She was not perfect, and I never say that she was. But still, she gave England a golden age in that time, where Protestantism ruled, ruled supreme. And when she died and her son took over, King James the Sixth of Scotland, as I remember correctly, I hope, and the First of England, in 1603 he took over, in 1604 he established the, um, the committee to translate the Bible, to make a Bible translation, which resulted in 1611 of the King James Bible, because... He survived the gunpowder plot in 1605 from the Jesuits. The 5th of November, remember, remember, the gunpowder plot, a day never to be forgot. Also a date that we are vastly approaching uh, for another uh, jubilee from 1605 through 2017. So we have to keep in mind that Tyndale's work on the Bible retained over 80% of what we except today as the inerrant word of God in the 1611 King James Bible. So, this means now that uh, the article of Tyndale is, is gone and uh, we are going back to uh, the article of Martin Luther. So we see here, of course, this is the cover through in Truth and History magazine and then here we have uh, on the right side or left side, depends on what <laughs> how you look. When I'm sitting in front of my screen, it's the right side. A mighty fortress is our God, the father of the Reformation, defender of the face, uh, Martin Luther. And this is the last article of this little booklet that I'm going to uh, read to you. Now, it's um, interesting that uh, we come across, when we read this, um, the author Robert Caringola, and Robert Caringola is uh, uh, the author of the book 70 Weeks, A Historical Alternative, which um, I will read here on my channel in the future. So, just that you are informed about that, 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 re uh, that reading will be done uh, within the next coming months, I'm quite sure. So, let's continue. A mighty fortress is our God. Like a prophet of old, Martin Luther was predestined and anointed to be an instrument of God to call the people of Europe back to biblical Christianity and to throw off the bondage of Romanism. This is a very interesting sentence because I got here a little text where I save some quotes. And when we take a look at this, we can see that, for example, Romanism and the Reformation, author Henry Grattan Guinness says, quote, the Reformation was not the formation of the Church, but its reformation after its ruin by Romanism. 
Pentecost formed the church, Popery deformed it, Protestantism reformed it. So there are some interesting quotes in here. And uh, I just read a few of you, but I'm not going to go through the whole document here. But I thought this uh, in the beginning, the Reformation was not the formation of the church, but its reformation after it's ruined by Romanism. I'm going to take a little break. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to take a little break there because um, some rain started and I had some things outside hanging to dry. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Like a prophet of old, Martin Luther was predestined and anointed to be an instrument of God to call the people of Europe back to biblical Christianity and to throw off the bondage of Romanism. We have to understand when we read things about this quote-unquote reformation, which you know already now that I am not uh, eager to use that term, but the starting of Protestantism, that there was only one ruling church at that time in, in the world, and that was the Roman Catholic Church. And um, people like John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, John Huss, and also Martin Luther, all came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, when you come out of the Roman Catholic Church because you've never experienced anything else in your life, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden God tips you on your shoulder, and you see the light, and you see the truth, and you read the Bible, and you understand that everything else that you have been taught up to here was a lie, then, of course, you cannot shake off everything that you have been taught all your life. And that is why probably uh, most of the reformers all had a little leaven of Roman Catholic doctrine still left in their teaching. And even Martin Luther. Because Martin Luther uh, also said, when was questioned about, um, about the, um, how do you say that, uh, about the Sabbath, um, that he had other things to do than concentrate himself on the Sabbath question. Well, that's one of the leavens uh, I find in, in, in Luther, one of the faults I find in Luther. But you know, you can find a fault in anyone. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is com complete, uh, complete righteous. Even though we are made righteous through Jesus Christ, as still as we are in the flesh, we are not infallible. Yeah, <laughs> we couldn't, because if we could be infallible, well, then the Pope could also be infallible. Then we had to accept him as God on earth, <laughs> which, which I don't, and you don't either. So, you know, it is not because someone here and there has a little bit mistake or a different understanding because he doesn't have the, the right knowledge that the person in itself is completely wrong. It's not that way. We have to understand that. Uh, Martin Luther had a little Catholic leaven left in his uh, in his blood. William Tyndale had probably two, uh, and John Wycliffe and John Huss, and certainly people like John Calvin and and uh, and others, and me too, even though I have never been Catholic. But you know, raised within the lies, uh, always here and there is a little bit that sticks to yourself. I, I wouldn't know what right now if you asked me, but uh, I'm not perfect. I know that. Nobody is. Neither Martin Luther. This is why this reading, this explanation of Martin Luther and all that stuff and this introduction to you of his work, also the, the coming book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil from Martin Luther, be, uh, I, I, I do this not to worship this guy or whatever. But by their fruits you will know them. And Martin Luther set almost all of Europe free with bringing them the Bible in their language. Like it started in England with uh, William Tyndale when his Bible was put out, as we have just read, um, that uh, from 1536 on, uh, his Bible was laid everywhere in the uh, in in the churches in England, yeah, 
uh, from 1539, a copy of the English Bible was required to be in every parish church in England. Uh, that's the fruit of William Tyndale's work. The fruit of Martin Luther's work is his writings and his Bible translation into German and from that German also into other languages which set almost all of Europe free. So this is why I dedicate this reading to Martin Luther and the good works that he did. I'm not judging him for the bad works that he did because everybody has a little leaven. Now Luther was born uh, on November 10th, 1483 in Eisleben, Saxony in Germany, that's Eastern Germany. While studying for a law degree, he was almost killed by a bolt of lightning. Pondering his close call with death, he changed his course of study from law to theology. He was educated at the University of Erfurt and was ordained an Augustinian priest at the age of 24. Five years later, he was ordained as a doctor of theology in the Roman Catholic Church. So he was born in 1483 and he was ordained an Augustinian priest at the age of 24, that's 1507. Five years later, in 1512, he was ordained as a doctor of theology in the Roman Catholic Church. And as you read Romanism and the Reformation and the account of Daubigne, where Luther got hand of the Bible the very first time, that must have been at the age of 2021, 20, so 14, uh, 1503, 1504. At that time, Luther, for the very first time, got a grip on the Bible. Now, as a professor of theology and philosophy at the University of Wittenberg, he challenged the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church, such as the supremacy of the popes, indulgences and other beliefs and practices which gained him extreme disfavor with the religious hierarchy. He advocated that the common people should be allowed to read the Bible and enjoy congressional singing. <laughs> Martin Luther advocated that the common people should be allowed to read the Bible. Well, there, of course, he goes into everything that the Roman Catholic Church ever stood for. Giving the people, the normal people, the possibility to read and study the Word of God for themselves? No way, says the Roman Catholic Church, because the normal man cannot understand the Bible. It needs to be explained by a priest. Yeah, right. Martin Luther wrote 37 hymns for public worship. On October 31st, 1517, he nailed his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, which resulted in the Pope's edict for Luther's excommunication and the burning of his writings in 1520. Now, let me comment a little bit on this. On October 31st, it says, in 1517, he nailed his 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Cathedral. There is no historical record, no historical proof that he actually nailed these teethers either to the church door or the castle door in Wittenberg in East Germany. But where there is historical record and proof for is that these 95 theses have been printed and distributed and by that were made public. I am not going to say that these 95 Theses were not nailed to the door. I am just saying there is no historical proof of that. So that might be only an interpretation. But what is sure is that he wrote these 95 Theses and they were copied and spread on a wide scale in Germany. And then it says here, 
that the Pope's edict for Luther's excommunication and the burning of his writings was in 1520. Now that was in 1521, the Edict of Worms, because in 1520 he still did all the writings, like uh, against the uh, for the Christian nobility and uh, the, of the Babylonian captivity of the Church. The one that just uh, in Inquisition update Tom Press read on First Commandment Radio, Martin Luther in his own words in that playlist. Uh, you will find uh, the readings of uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church from Martin Luther from 1520. Very interesting to follow Tom's reading there and explanation, of course. Now, in his book, The Present Reign of Jesus Christ, Robert Caringola, who I introduced to you a few minutes ago already, writes, quote, The period of time between the Leipzig debate with Eck in July 1519 and the Diet of Worms in April 1521, where you have confirmation of what I just said, was an exciting time for Luther. In May 1520, he published a pamphlet entitled On Good Works. Its effect was far-reaching. It emphasized his new conviction that man is saved by faith alone. On June 15th, 1520, Pope Leo X Antichrist Pope Leo X excommunicated Luther in a papal bull. Luther burned this document and replied, quote, As thou hast wasted the Holy One of God, so may the eternal flames waste thee. Unquote. And further re uh, retaliated with a tract entitled Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist. Now, <laughs> that is really something that I call dare, that I call have uh, guts, what Luther did here, right? He did not only take the bull of excommunication from the Pope and burned it, he also took canon law books out of the library of the university and burned them, and papal decrees and all that stuff, all the paper writings he burned together with that bull of excommunication. And then he says to the Pope in an answer, As thou hast wasted the Holy One of God, so may the eternal flames waste thee. And then he even wrote a tract entitled Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist. Now, there is guts. There is Protestantism. That what Luther did here has nothing to do with Reformation. That has everything to do with protest, protesting, even though the term itself only was formed in 1529, as we're going to read a little bit later in this paper. But that was protest what Martin Luther did. I mean, when he calls out the Pope as the Antichrist, that also means that he calls out the Roman Catholic Church as being the synagogue of Satan. At that moment, it must have been dawned him. <laughs> it must have dawned at him that there is no reformation. You cannot reform Satan. That's impossible. And that's why I just do not accept the term reformation anymore. But to me it is the great awakening of Protestantism. That's what I rather call it. Now swiftly following, the author continues here, Luther published what became known as the Three Great Reformation Treatises. The Christian Nobility of Germany, that was written in 1520, and I read this and analyzed this in one of the uh, in uh, a few readings an hour of the truth so you can find that in uh, hour of the truth in english the christian nobility of germany called to reject the abuses fostered by rome and then of course the babylonian captivity of the church in which luther destroyed rome's claim that men could only be saved through the priesthood and in its sacramental system those Two writings, very important. The Christian nobility of Germany, uh, of the German, uh, the Christian nobility of Germany, or what's it called here? Yeah, that's um, uh, the original title is a little bit different, but doesn't matter. 
and uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church. Those two writings, uh, Tom Fress uh, read a few weeks ago uh, in this playlist of uh, Martin, uh, Martin Luther in his own words on First Amendment Radio. You can find that there and the playlist, of course, is uh, included in the description box of this video. So you can find that very easy and then uh, follow the reading that Tom does with his explanation on First Amendment Radio. Or you can look up the Christian nobility on my channel, Joggler66. Uh, there were two or three episodes, an hour of the truth in the time when I still was with Walt Stickle when I read that. Uh, Babylonian captivity of the church, I have never done in English. I started that in German, but the paper in German is much smaller than the paper in English, so that I have to get the original book before I do that. Anyway, we continue here. Um, the liberty of the Christian man, this is what Martin Luther wrote, and that's why I told you when we were just reading about uh, William Tyndale, who wrote the, ob the obedience of a Christian, and Martin Luther wrote the liberty of the Christian man, and those are kind of familiar, because William Tyndale was, um, how do you say that, um, he was familiar with the writings of Martin Luther, he knew the writings of Martin Luther, and probably took a little bit from that, which is no problem, which is not planetary or, or whatever, that's alright that he did that. Martin Luther wrote the liberty of the Christian man, containing the sum of the Christian life. Now, Luther was brought to trial at Worms, uh, that's 1521, and was commanded by Emperor Charles V to retract his heretical beliefs. He replied, and here we have not the whole uh, quote, that's why I'm going to read to you the more uh, complete quote, to go against the conscience is neither fair nor safe, I cannot and will not recant. Here I stand. So help me God. Amen. Martin Luther refused to accept the orders of a man to put his conscience under the control of the Pope instead of the control of the Creator God of the Bible. That's what he did. That's what a lot of Christians before him did. When we study the Inquisition, you will know that. And that's what a lot of people after him did too. And that's what you should do too. And that's what I am doing also. I will not accept another authority on my conscience but the Creator God of the Bible. Point. I will not accept another authority above me but my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ point. And that's what Martin Luther said here. But it takes guts to stand there in front of the emperor of whole of Europe and to declare it is not safe to go against conscience, nor is it fair to go against conscience. I cannot and will not recant. Here I take my stand, so help me God. Amen. Luther said also, Prove me wrong by scripture and I will recant. But they could not. They could not reprove him scripturally because everything Luther said was scripture. It was impossible for them. The Roman Catholic Church was powerless at that moment against him. I cannot and will not recant. Here I take my stand. So help me God. Amen. But still, the court sentenced Luther to prison in the custody of his friend Frederick, a Roman elector who turned a blind eye, while Luther worked on his New Testament translation and even allowed his escape. Then Luther went to the Wartburg where he translated the Bible in 1521-1522. And he stayed on the Wartburg under a pseudonym, under an AKA, also known as. Yeah? And the name that he had was Junker Jörg. A Junker is a kind of a servant of a knight. And Jörg 
was his pseudonym. Interesting that my name also is Jörg. I just like this quote-unquote coincidence. Luther wrote a formal protest against oppression, resulting in the term Protestant. On the eve of a bitter court battle in 1529, Luther wrote his famous hymn to encourage his friends who were facing the wrath of the authorities. We are speaking here about the uh, Edict of uh, Augsburg, the, uh, um, uh, the, no, not the Edict, um, but uh, that meeting that they had in Augsburg there in 1529-1530, where, among others, Melanchthon uh, proposed to the Emperor their stance, which came about to the same thing that Martin Luther did in 1521, when he said, I cannot and will not recant, here I take my stand. But Melanchthon, um, they had the Augsburg Confession, that is it's called, and Luther was furious with Melanchthon because of the wording that he used. He did not renounce the Pope as the Antichrist that he is. Uh, Luther was really furious about this soft talk that was spoken there. But anyway, that led to the forming of the term Protestant and Protestantism in 1529-1530 with the Augsburg Confession. Now Martin Luther died then on February 18, 1546, but he wrote this book against the Roman papacy, An Institution of the Devil, in 1545. That book was published on the 25th of March, 1545, and on the 18th of February in 1546 he dies in uh, Eisleben, that is the same city where he was born. So this book, Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil from Martin Luther, is his very last work. It is his very last work. Now Luther declared three great Reformation principles. First, as we can read in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, man is justified by faith alone. Second, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, every believer has direct access to God. It is the personal relationship that we have with our Savior Jesus Christ that is making the big difference between salvation and not salvation. Because when you are in another church, you pay your allegiance to the Pope and not Jesus Christ. And number three, the Bible is the sole source of authority for faith in uh, for, uh, of authority for faith and life, as we can read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This brings my little excursion of this book, Truth in History, to a conclusion. I hope that you enjoyed me reading this little pamphlet about the quote-unquote Reformation, which I rather call the... call to awake, the call to Protestantism. I'm really not thinking about terms, you know. I'm, <laughs> I'm just giving you an idea. Anyway, we are continuing a reading in the book now Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil by Luther from 1545. And I'm just going to read to you the introduction, which is about three pages long. And then we come to a conclusion of this little video. Um, and then, of course, when you give me a thumbs up for uh, reading the complete book, then I will try to mix that into my plans of other English readings that I have already to also read this complete book to you uh, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil from Martin Luther <coughs> from 1545. Now, with this... I'm leave it, leaving it here to the introduction. I'm going to start this. This is uh, found in the book uh, Luther's Works, Volume 41, Church and Ministry, Volume 3, uh, on page 259. I start. I was actually planning to read the whole book, uh, which has a uh, editor's preface, very interesting, 
and uh, then it goes into the introduction of this volume then it starts about the councils on the councils and the church a writing that martin luther did in 1539 because he was always very busy with the councils and of course the approaching council of trent at that time and then the second part of this book is um, against hans wurst um, that's also an interesting pamphlet and then, of course, we have what I'm going to read to you right now, Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil from 1545, translated by Eric W. Gritch. And before I even start, I want to tell you that this English version has something that the German version doesn't have. So I even prefer the English above the German version, because, uh, first of all, the German version is very difficult to read in 16th century German. But... Um, the English version has a lot, a lot of footnotes. And with these footnotes, it is very interesting um, to um, get more background knowledge while reading this book that you do not get when you read the German version. In the German version, there is not one footnote. And there are some expressions in that are just not explained. And in the English version, these expressions, terms, even translations from the original Latin into English are explained. In German, uh, there's only the Latin uh, and not a translation from the Latin into the German. So when I was reading the book in German, I had to uh, open the English translation of the Luther's German work <laughs> and read the English translation of the Latin terms that was in there and then translate that into German to make known to my German brethren what Luther wrote in Latin in the German version where it is not translated. So, now that's enough of introduction to me to read this. Now we're going to use the last few minutes of this uh, probably one hour um, to read to you the introduction of Martin Luther's last and final work from 1545 against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. This treatise, the most bitter of Luther's polemic writings, is intimately related to the political power struggle between Pope and Emperor. The struggle reached its climax when Emperor Charles V made many concessions to the German Protestant princes at the Diet of Spires in 1545, uh, in 1544, in order to gain their support for his war against Francis I of France and the Turks. And with the Turks, you should read that today and understand that today, of course, as Islam. The recess of the 10th of June 1544 guaranteed ecclesiastical revenues to holders of Protestant benefices, the suspension of lawsuits against Protestants already in progress at the Supreme Court, and the abolition of recesses passed by previous diets and, uh, against Protestants. Moreover, it announced plans for another German diet at which a, quote, Christian Reformation by devout and peace-loving men, unquote, would be discussed. The recess did not even mention the Pope or ecclesiastical authority. Hm. Yeah, a detailed account of the events between the Diet of Spires and the Council of Trent is given in Ernest Graf's work A History of the Council of Trent. Uh, this is also one of the wonderful things in the English version. You see all the sources and uh, even going uh, deeper explanations mentioned in this reading. So when you really have access to a lot of libraries and books, you can confirm everything that is written in this book from Martin Luther historically from other authors. Yeah? Very important. So this is not conspiracy theory that I am reading here. This is absolutely researched and even confirmed by other authors. A detailed account of the events between the Diet of Spires and the Council of Trent is given in a history of the Council of Trent. And the Diet of Spires was, as we just read before, 1529. Now, when the contents of the recess became known in Rome, Antichrist Pope Paul III, who ordained the Jesuit order in 1540, as you probably know, immediately convoked a consistory and had an admonitory brief drawn upon the emperor. 
he charged Cardinal Giovanni Morone, who was at that time at Lyon in France, with its delivery to the imperial court. The brief, originally consisting of two drafts, the first was more radical than the second, was completed on August 24th. It accused the Emperor of interference in the rights of the Apostolic See, demanded the withdrawal of all concessions made to Protestants and threatened, in careful terminology, stern papal action if the Emperor should refuse to comply. Finally, the assertion was made that the General Council, rather than an imperial diet, should create a settlement of the religious issues dividing Germany, thus repeating the fundamental principle of medieval papalism that Rome is to be arbiter in temporal affairs and judge in religious affairs. Did you get it? Very important to understand here. The Pope says that there was rather a general council than an imperial diet and that Rome means the Antichrist, means the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, means the Pope is to be arbiter in temporal affairs and judge in religious affairs. So there is no power higher than the Pope. Nobody speaks of God, of the Bible. Rome is to be arbiter in temporal affairs, meaning the conflict that the emperor had at that time with the king of France and with the Turks. Rome is arbiter in these temporal affairs and is the judge in religious affairs when the emperor, as we just read here, gave the Protestants recess and rights the Pope has the right to intervene. That's what this actually means. Now, continuing. The admonitory brief, however, never accomplished its purpose due to a series of diplomatic mishaps. Cardinal Morone could not be located by the papal emissary at the imperial court in Brussels when Emperor Charles V was directing his war against France. When the emperor refused to see the emissary, the brief was returned to Rome and a copy was left in Brussels. By the time the emperor learned the contents of the document, it was outdated. A peace had been negotiated on September 8, 1544, between Charles V, the emperor, and Francis I, the king of France, in which they agreed that a general council should be held at Trent, and Antichrist Pope Paul III felt compelled to congratulate them in two further briefs composed in October 1544. Now, <laughs> actually so, the Emperor Charles V and Francis I, the King of France, got together and more or less ordered that there is to be called a council at Trent. The consistory then proposed on November 14th, 1544, to convoke a general council on March 25th, 1545. Now, where have we heard that date, March 25th, 1545, before? <laughs> I tell you, in the book, in the German book of Martin Luther, against the papacy, the Roman papacy and institution of the devil, there is a little, um, how do you say that, a uh, curriculum of Martin Luther at the end of the book. And from that, his biography, and from that biography, I just read to you a few minutes ago, that on the 25th of March, 1545, the book against the papacy, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil was published the same day the general council at Trent was to be started the same day Martin Luther published his work against the Roman papacy an institution of the devil both drafts of the papal admonitory brief were already known to German Protestants by December 1544 <coughs> through friends in Venice. 
Rumors of its existence had reached Elector John Frederick of Saxony in October. Copies of both drafts were delivered to him on December 27th through Philip of Hesse, the leader of the small cult league. Luther received them sometime before January 1545 and immediately started a furious refutation which was published on March 25th, the day the Council of Trent was to convene, thus against the Roman papacy an institution of the devil became a key instrument of Protestant propaganda against papal diplomacy. Now, in March 1545, John Calvin also produced a propaganda tract by publishing the text of the brief with sarcastic comments. His paternal admonition of Pope Paul III, published in Geneva, is still available when you can lay your hands on that. So, Luther, together with Calvin, were against the Council of Trent. And Luther published his work the same day that council convened. Ain't that a quote-unquote coincidence? Now, the treatise was meant to propagate political Protestantism, although Luther would certainly have written it without the encouragement of the elector and the leaders of the small called League. Within two months of publication, it was praised by Landgrave Philip of Hesse, delivered to King Christian III of Denmark, and read with anger by papal legates to the Diet of Worms and Trent. A series of cartoons by Lucas Cranach, created in the same year and probably intended to serve as illustrations of the treatise, also appeared. Now, in a footnote, we read here that the picture series is found in Fritz Hermann's Luther Bibliothek des uh, Paulus Museums der Stadt Worms. And uh, Kranach also produced woodcuts for Luther's German Bible and many of his pamphlets. So he was, let's say, uh, the home artist of Martin Luther. This uh, Luther, uh, this, um, what's it called? This Kranach. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Interesting, huh? That he made the illustrations to the treatise, but uh, Lucas Cranach. But this book against the Roman papacy has no um, has no images, has has no cartoons or nothing written in it. I'm gonna give you another picture here that you see that I'm still alive here. <laughs> now, just as Jonas, Luther's friend translated the treatise into Latin in November 1545, thus assuring its international distribution. Because Latin at that time was the international language, as English is today. Luther meant to edit the translation and send it to Trent, but was prevented from doing so by his illness. He died on February 18, 1546. The treatise is Luther's last great testimony against the papacy, which he called my great anguish. He dealt here with three questions. First, whether it is true that the Pope is supreme lord over Christendom, whether that the Pope is supreme lord over councils, angels and everything else. Second, whether it is true that no one can judge or depose the Pope. And third, whether it is true that he brought the reign of the Roman Empire from the Greeks to the Germans, that is, whether German emperors could receive the title Holy Roman Empire of the German nation only from the Pope, a fiction fostered by the Popes since the coronation of Charles the Great by Antichrist Pope Leo III, in 800. Luther had already dealt with this question in an open letter to the Christian nobility, which I told you you can find on the playlist Hour of the Truth in two or three readings there. An open letter to the Christian nobility. That's what that work from 1520 is called. And he dealt already with these points in there, but of course very, very brief very, very extensive in this book, and he even mentions at the end of this book that he wants to write another part, but God didn't spare him the time. Luther seemed to know that he had not much time left. Death would come soon. 
but before the fiercest enemy of his cause, the papacy received his scorn and violent condemnation, which we can read about in the book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. This polemical tract, like against Hans Wurst, the other work that is in the same book here before that I'm going to read in the future, hopefully, reveals the faith and wrath of the old Luther. Yet one should not forget that his tracts usually originated as replies against equally abusive and violent attacks. Dogmatic, superstitious, intolerant, overbearing and violent as he was, he yet had that inscrutable prerogative of genius of transforming what he touched into new values. The first edition of the treatise was printed by Hans Luft in Wittenberg. The title page carried a woodcut showing the Pope in the jaws of hell. I'm going to take a look, going to see if I can ever get a picture of that to show you while I'll do the book reading then. Four German editions and two Latin translations appeared in the first year, followed by two more German editions in 1565. The translation is based upon the first edition. The text is given in works 54.206-299. I want to thank Miss Doris Jackson for her help in the preparation of this translation. And this finishes the introduction. After that comes the real work of Martin Luther against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And as I said before, if you're going to let me know with a thumbs up and uh, uh, with a comment that you want me to read that book, then I'm going to read that completely to you in English as soon as I can on my channel, Joggler66. With this, I want to conclude the reading for today. And um, I'm going to see uh, what kind of reactions you gave to the first video, if I'm going to publish this even during the month of October. Otherwise, that will be just released in November, because, as I said, I have so many parts of the book reading in Germany that I promised my German brethren to publish within the month of October, the quote-unquote Reformation months, the 500 years anniversary of Martin Luther if not nailing to the church door at Wittenberg, but publishing the 95 Theses against indulgences, which is simony, which I explain to you where it comes from in another video. So, that's it for today. Jörg from Jogler66 is going to take a little break now. <laughs> <laughs> now, until next time. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for commenting and encouraging. You know, I'm going to do the work anyway, if anybody watches this or not, but I just try to also do some English publications during the month of October, if you urge me to. Then I just squeeze them in there, and then you just have to look at the emails when you subscribe to my channel. Um, then it can help that you uh, can also... Uh, get informed when I do a new upload and then you won't miss anything on this wonderful work of Protestantism in the 500 years of quote-unquote Reformation. No, of the awakening of Protestantism that it was in my own words. So, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, thanks for commenting. Until next time, Jogna66 from Hour of the Truths says God bless you, signing off and... <laughs>
souls to sing together.